Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Gilbert Hurt. He is Emeritus Professor of Human Sexual Sexuality Studies and Anthropology and the founder of the Department of Sexuality Studies and the National Sexuality Research Center at San Francisco State University. He conducted long-term long field work among the Sambia people of Papua New Guinea and has written widely on the nature and variation in human sexual expression in Papu Papua New Guinea, Melanesia, and other cultures. So, Dr. Hurt, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. So, first of all, tell us about the peoples you studied in on Papua New Guinea, Melanesia, and elsewhere. I mean, what are the kinds of societies we're talking about here? Well, uh, I'm happy to talk about them because I've been re-studying them. I'm uh, completing my magnum opus after many, many years, which is called The Singers Are Gone, and I've been fully engaged in it the last two years during, in the lockdown uh, of the pandemic uh, where I live in Bali. Um, the, the Sambia, who I've now used the real name for as of two years ago, the Chimbari. The Chimbari people are one of the tribal peoples who form uh, a group of cultures which is known as Kuka Kuka or Anga. Uh, they're ancient. Um, we don't know what their origin is, but like many other Melanesian groups, they were small-scale hunters and gatherers, also horticulturalists, um, and they lived in mostly sedentary villages in the center of Papua New Guinea, which is the eastern half of the island of New Guinea, which was divided up by colonial rule beginning in the 17th century. And the Chimbari, um, had a patriarchal culture. They had patrilineal uh, ship. Uh, they reckoned descent through the male line. They were a warrior culture. They engaged in uh, war raids. Uh, they were not cannibals, but they did uh, regard almost all people outside of their of the small boundary of their society, which was about 2,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, 2,000 Chimbari speakers when I first started studying there in 1974. Um, and uh, the boys and the girls were initiated into their secret religion, uh, which we could call in general in, a, in the Western sense, a mystery religion with, with pagan gods. And they believed in spirits, uh, both in nature as well as in the world. Uh, they were afraid of ghosts. Uh, and the initiation of boys were really quite elaborate. They started when the boys were seven to ten years old. Um, and it involved uh, removing them from their mother's and father's houses and placing them in the men's house, which was the warrior clubhouse of each village. The villages were small. They ranged typically from about 50 to 100 people. Um, and then they were inducted into um, a series of rituals which were aimed at strengthening their bodies, uh, masculinizing them. And because of their belief that the, that the human body does not naturally produce semen or sperm, the Chimbari always used um, a form of uh, ritual sex, which I call boy insemination, which Re required older boys to inseminate orally younger boys and they proceeded that in that manner for the next 15 to 20 years it was a secret system and when the boys reached uh, their social puberty which was around 15 or 16 they would uh, change or transform from being the passive recipients to semen into becoming the active inseminators of the younger boys and that then paved the way for the assignment of a woman uh, to their marriage. And it also enabled them to begin um, uh, actively and be actively involved in war raids and also other warrior and ritual activities, ultimately with the aim when they were around 20 or their early 20s of being married and producing children. And, of course, there are many, many other 
details, the myths, the folklores, the belief system, the, the rituals they learn, secret spells, the f lore of the forest. Uh, they, this is the people who live in the high cloud forest of the Kraki Mountains of uh, Papua New Guinea. And so they are completely at home in this beautiful, pristine nature that surrounds them. So maybe I'll stop there and let you continue. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you a specific question uh, about fieldwork. So how do you study sexuality and specifically sexual orientation on the field? Well, the general principle of anthropology always is holism or contextualism in which all the knowledge that we gather is grounded in a particular field of data, of knowledge, of perspective. And most anthropologists subscribe to a principle of cultural relativism in which they believe that uh, the perception of the observer is the way in which we focus all of our observations. And without understanding that uh, perception, we're not able to correctly interpret all of the data that pertain. That's about everything. Language, culture, religion, economy, and so on and so on. Gender, sexuality. Sexuality is not necessarily any different than studying, say, religion or economy, except that, as Margaret Mead observed long, long time ago, 1960, she observed that in many many, many cultures of the world, for some reason or other, sexuality is kept secret or hidden or is made private. So therefore, as Alfred Kinsey, the great sexologist in the United States, um, once really stated in emphatic way, the most important thing for us to do is to be able to be sure that we get good empirical data that grounds what people say, because we don't necessarily know that what they say is true and that what they say about what they do in private is correct and corresponds to their actual experience rather than boasting or lying or evading or uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's in general true in New Guinea. Uh, New Guinea has approximately uh, 2,000 different uh, cultures and approximately 1,000 different languages. And each one of those had separate patterns of sexual behavior, even though in, in a, a certain general way, as I see it, uh, human sexuality does unite us with all people around the world. There is a common or uniform pattern of intimacy, of romance, of love, of uh, sexual engagement. There's a limited number of uh, forms of uh, sexual interaction uh, or co copulation or coitus. Um, so with the Chimbari, uh, the single most, f the biggest barrier really is, first of all, gaining their trust. And that means that people really do respect you because you respect them, that they recognize that you know enough about their culture and language that you're able to appreciate what they say. Uh, that sometimes if they're just telling stories and not telling the truth, you're able to discern the difference between the story and the truth. For example, the Chimbari um, are dream sharers, night dream sharers. They, when they wake up in the morning, they tell their dreams to other people. And sometimes they mix them into the stream of life, just like other ordinary things that happen to them, like going to the garden. And sometimes people will interrupt them when they're telling a, a dream narrative in the usually in the morning and say they'll say to them is this a dream or is this did this really happen they'll say something like that so it's important that the observer or the anthropologist or ethnographer is able to be able to engage in that kind of dialectic with them and and engage them and ask them questions and so the other main barrier that i would say is that for the chimbari like almost where most non-Western peoples are not verbal when it comes to their sexual experience. They regard it as something that's private to them. They don't necessarily feel any reason to talk about it or even this, and certainly not to report it. And 
unless they're boasting. And men sometimes boast about their conquests with women or uh, in secret, they, bo they boast about their conquests with boys. So the, the problem with that is uh, being sure that we're able to ask them and interpret them and what they say is accurate. And uh, the last thing I would say about it is in um, asking people about their innermost feelings and thoughts, which even the Chimbari, although they're not nor it's not normal for them, they're able to do most of the time. They'll say, well, this is what I felt or this is what happened and so on and so on. Um, I think the, the important thing is to have a long period of time and to become known to them and trusted and to become patient uh, because not some people are shy and not everybody wants to talk about these things. And there's certain uh, collaborators that I had or uh, certain informants, respondents in the village. It, it was, took me years to get them to unlock and tell about their experiences. And I just had to be patient and keep coming back to them and, and being respectful and nice to them. And it was in that way over many, many years that I was able to trace or put together the pattern of, of different kinds of sexual things that happened to them. Mm -hmm. By studying those societies, those cultures, what would you say were some of the main things you learned about how sexual attraction develops? Well, um, it's a it's a big question. Uh, let me ask. Uh, let me answer by saying that um, uh, I came to realize that um, in my observations. Uh, what the Chimbari were saying about the age of uh, initiation was actually very important. Uh, they had repeatedly said uh, they re initiate boys from ages 7 to 10. And they had said, you know, we've got to do this by the time they're 10 or 9 or certainly not, not by 11. If we don't do this, they will never be able to be initiated. They won't, it will never be successful. And I, I really didn't understand that when they first started talking about it. It seemed so arbitrary to me. What, what is, why is 10 of any importance or nine? Um, and it took me years to understand when I started doing uh, studies of LGBT youth in Chicago. Um, and I was collecting quantitative data on a data set of about 225 boys and girls, uh, average age. Uh, 17, um, uh, who were in the process of coming out and expressing their sexual feelings and desires. Um, and I began to realize when looking at the data that many of them said it was around the age of 10 that they discovered their sexual feelings and desires. And so one day I was in my office at the University of Chicago at that time, and I was actually looking at the spreadsheet which my assistant had dropped off in my mailbox and I was standing holding it up and pouring over it, and I was just pondering and then suddenly my colleague Dr. Martha McClintock, McClintock uh, walked into the mailroom and she said what are you doing and I said well I'm, I'm studying this data sheet and it just has me baffled um, and I told her briefly that I'd always had this recognition that the tribal people said that age 10 was important. And then I was looking at these data, which revealed that a lot of the boys and girls had between ages 8 and 10, a recognition of their own sexual feelings and desires. And in fact, part of that recognition was they, were, they became more and more aware as they developed their cognitive apparatus that society was going to begin to make moral judgments about them based upon their sexual conduct, whether it was with the same gender or the other gender. And as I was studying this, uh, my colleague, uh, Martha McClintock, said to me, well, I can tell you why age 10 is important. And I looked at her and total surprise. And I said, well, well what is it? And she, she told me that's when the age of secondary puberty, gonadal puberty, kicks in. And then she explained to me the difference.
difference between adrenal puberty, which begins around age six or seven, and results in a surge of hormones inside the body for boys and girls. And then the second surge occurs through the, uh, the blood system in the human body around age nine or 10 or 11. And so after a period of time, I began to study patterns of the distribution of sexual attraction that kind of was associated with or co-identified with the age of 10 and discovered that in many New Guinea cultures, there was uh, recognition in the culture that something was happening inside the human body. So long story short, it would appear that there are certain internal forces, intrinsic forces that are hormonal, possibly genetic, possibly brain initiated neurological that are uh, serve as triggers uh, that send us cues that enable us to begin to then respond to information in the environment, including human interactions, which result in what we would call sexual recognition, sexual awareness, sexual attraction, sexual orientation. And as you probably know, there has been in recent times, uh, as a result of very important research by people like Lisa Diamond and others, uh, the recognition that um, sexual orientation or desire may operate differently in men and women. Um, uh, that there's a greater degree of sexual fluidity in women mm -hmm. than there is men after a certain period of time. And in general, I also subscribe to that view. But I believe that in human cultures where the whole world is defined for us linguistically and in material things, that we have to pay attention very much to the um, intricate, subtle patterns, which include verbal cues as well as bodily language, body, body language cues that enable humans to begin to respond and where the internal trigger, if we want to call it that, begins to pick up and surround itself with the social cues, the social information that forms the total body. And in that way, we avoid being reductionists. And we don't, uh, we don't develop the view that there's some biological switch and you turn it on and operates. Mm -hmm. And it's automatic in all people. No, it's not like that. Humans are much more intelligent, uh, are much more interactors and mediators of these variables inside of themselves. And so for that reason, I've come to think that uh, in human sexual development and human sexual nature, we're always best to study both the biological forces as well as the social and cultural forces and see the minute interactions between them, beginning in early infancy, and how those uh, are added to, reinforced, patterned by the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and in what ways does culture influence sexual orientation or the development of sexual orientation? Yeah. Well, for the Chimbari, the primary answer is ritual. It's their mystery religion. It's their rituals. And actually, I, for the purpose of my new book, I have used a concept which I call ritual sex, which I had not previously used, even though it's more or less congruent with the same data that I reported beginning in my first book, which is Guardians of the Flutes, around 1980. And ritual sex refers to a concept in which all of the elements of sexual functioning and sexual practice are regulated by ritual dynamics. That can be taboos, that can be beliefs, it can be ritual punishment, ritual pleasure and rewards. Mm -hmm. And for some reason or other, the Chimbari, uh, like many of their surrounding neighboring tribes, they took the the sexual act and they totally ritualized it totally so that there's a totalizing process of their uh, sexuality that leaves almost nothing bare 
almost everything surrounding the sexual process has been ritualized, I think to ensure that their formula for sexual development succeeds, that the rituals are going to move boys away from girls and move them toward boys, and it's going to also keep girls in a certain gender role until they're married as virgins, and that those um, different ritual markers uh, are very powerful internal motivators and external social devices for ensuring that the people conform to the rules. For example, when boys reach that age of around 14 or 15, and they're still the semen recipients, the passive fellatures, uh, some of them begin to get, they have sexual arousal, they become horny, they want to have sexual interactions with young boys and uh, inseminate the younger boys just like they're being inseminated. That, of course, is forbidden in their, uh, in their ritual system. And if they're caught doing that, they're severely punished. Um, so the rituals hold that in check. Some of the boys still do it, and when they when it's been discovered, in my the book I'm working on now, I talk about several examples of that. They're punished, but they're not ostracized. They're not considered to be, for example, sexual pederasts. They're considered to be boys who are too overeager, who got ahead of themselves, who didn't follow the ritual system. So then, in that way the punishment forces them to come back into the fold of the ritual ritual role until they achieve the next uh, ritual initiation, which for them would be when they're, they have their social puberty around age 15 or so. And then they're allowed in the ritual context to make the transformation from being the, the fellator to the fellator. Mm -hmm. So, and I hope I'm not saying anything wrong here, and if I am, please correct me, but as far as I know, all human societies have norms regarding sexuality and sexual behavior. So, where do these come from? I mean, how do they develop? It's, it's a very good question, um, and I would also concur that all societies have sexual rules, sexual, if we want to call them norms, sexual patterns, which surround their expectations of what is moral human behavior, what we should do and what we should not do. And those are extremely powerful in every culture. Um, the problem in the English language is that when we use the term norm or normative or normal, which are all interrelated, when we use those concepts, it sounds as if they are universals, as if they apply to all societies without any changes added. But of course, that's not correct. Societies have plenty of sexual differences that um, some of them are dramatic and some of them are just very, very simple uh, differences that are quite different than the Western norms we have. Um, for example, uh, our society would never allow a younger and older boy to have homoerotic sexual practice in the way that I've described it for the Chimbari. But that for the Chimbari, that is not only the norm, that is actually what their religion requires them to do. And without that, they will never get, they will never achieve uh, biological and social puberty. So. Many anthropologists, I think, have struggled with this question. How do we understand the difference between the local norm or social pattern and the universals, which seem to involve, for example, all human beings, uh, all human groups engage in coitus, uh, family formation and reproduction, because otherwise how would the human species reproduce itself? Uh, there is a very, very general level that seems to pertain to all of us as a species, Homo sapiens sapiens, and and I accept that. And I feel what what human culture has done is create 
small eco worlds, uh, which vary somewhat from society to society, which give people a feeling of belonging, of being a member of that society, of adhering to the norms, of being moral, of being proper, of being a sexual creature. And without that uh, bubble of um, attention that surrounds them, it's not as easy for humans to relate and uh, feel that they are fully engaged in their sexual development. And one of the things that it's interesting to mention about here is that uh, is the question, is a romantic love universal? The way that we in Western culture think about sex, we think about sex almost immediately associated with love and especially with romance and falling in love and infatuation and uh, having limerence and being uh, at least for a short time in love with someone. Um, and the, the question is, is that universal? And the answer is no, it's not universal. It doesn't appear to be present in all societies. The Chimbori didn't have romantic love in the way that I just described it. But as their culture changed in response to colonialism, pacification or conquest from the reigning colonial power, which was the Australians, as the Christian missionaries moved in, and evangelical Christianity took over, which it began to do uh, in the late uh, 1970s and early 1980s. And by now, approximately 75 or 80 percent of all the Chimbari tribal people right now are practicing evangelical Christian people. And, of course, the ritual system, which they once had, is now only history. And they gave that up a long time ago, or better to say that they buried it a long time ago, so it would not be found. And the gender roles continued to transform, and women began, became more and more agentic and aware of their own uh, power. And so today, uh, in 2022, romantic love is one of the norms that Chimbori boys and girls have together, after this two generations of social change and sexual changes led to them. But their grandparents had no such concept. They didn't recognize it. They didn't know about it. They had no concept of love marriage, which is what it's called now uh, among the Chimbori and, and other New Guinea peoples. Mm -hmm. Is sexuality a common topic of conversation among the people's from these societies you've studied? I mean, is it something people talk about with one another, their sexuality, their sexual orientation, and so on? In the way that you've asked the question, the answer is no, it's not. It's not a common topic of discussion. Um, and so the way that I would uh, think about it in, in their own lens, their own social and cultural and linguistic lens is they talk about the thing, the feelings that they have at a certain moment. They talk about their sexual drive and desires. They talk about the need to be married and have children. They talk about sometimes about being horny. Um, they talk about their sense of wanting to have an attractive mate. That's also very common. Um, uh, they don't, since the Chimbari didn't have a concept of sexual orientation, they only had a concept of sexual drive. The orientation was embedded in the ritual sex. It was embedded in the ritual apparatus, which doesn't mean to say that the individual boys and girls didn't have a sense of their own sexual desire and sexual object formation. They, of course they had that. But there was no language to talk about that. That was outside of their, the ritual structure that they lived in. So um, I think the biggest source of uh, social information around uh, sexuality that the Chimbari talked about was first the ritual norms that we've talked about, 
such as having sex with a boy or having sex with a woman and doing it in a certain way and following that rule and not diverging from it because they believed it was dangerous to diverge from it. It would harm the human body. It might result in something bad happening to their body. They might get sick or they might become polluted if they didn't follow the ritual rules. And that was a very, very big topic about them. It was constantly floating around. So that was present. And the other one was they were constantly focused on uh, being married, getting married, having children, and the production of children. They liked children, and they liked to have children. And it also made a man and a woman feel like they were complete social beings, and they were recognized by the society as adults. So someone who did not aspire to have that process of transformation, producing children, was simply never going to be accepted as an adult person and therefore would never have the status in their own community. Mm -hmm. uh, so people from the societies you studied, would you say they are more tolerant of homosexuality than, for example, uh, we have been in Western history, perhaps not so much in more recent decades. Uh, I mean, perhaps we've been more tolerant in recent decades, but would you say they are more tolerant of it? Or is it just something that, uh, I mean, for example, sexual intercourse between two men is something that happens in the context of a ritual and they don't even think about it in those terms, like, for example, homosexuality or some equivalent? That's correct. They don't have a concept of homosexuality. They don't have a concept of being gay or lesbian. Um, and they had no concept of sexual relations between equals. That absolutely does not exist mm. for the Chimbori. It was impossible for them to imagine that there could be sexual relations between two adult men. Um, even their concept of sex between a man and woman was not inherently equal. They always regarded women as being uh, younger than them by four or five years, mm -hmm. therefore less experienced and sophisticated. They also regard, because there's a difference in height and stature between men and women, women are typically several inches shorter than men, that women were also not the physical equal of men. So in their minds, the uh, relationship between men and women was also inherently unequal because of the nature of the, the difference. But the spirit of your question is, did the Chimbari accept um, sexual relations between two males uh, as something that was normal and natural? And the answer is absolutely yes, they did in the context of the ritual system that they occupied, it was absolutely normal and natural. And any boy who didn't do it was not natural and normal. Mm -hmm. They were going to have trouble in life. Um, later on, in years that ensued as a result of pacification and missionization, they became more and more intolerant of any deviations from Western norms. And today, the Chimbari, I would say in general, are probably intolerant of homosexuality in the Western sense. And many of them are absolutely unawares that they had in their ancestral system a, uh, a system of ritual sex between, uh, between males and uh, younger and older males. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the best way of understanding homosexuality from the perspective of anthropology, more specifically cultural anthropology, because from uh, a biological perspective, it seems very much of a puzzle and the biologists haven't come up with an answer to why it has evolved yet. But yeah. do, do you think that at least when it comes to humans, homo sapiens, that a culture can provide an answer to it? You know, I subscribe to my mentor's uh, view about this issue in general. Robert J. Stoller, the psychoanalyst, was my mentor. Um, and we wrote a book together, which is called Intimate Communications in 1990. Um, and his 
his view was not not unlike Freud's view in that saying that uh, for whatever combination of reasons, which could be genetic, it could be hormonal, it could be uh, endocrinologically, it could be neurologically, that there's a biological force that results in some individuals being attracted to other individuals of the same gender. And I subscribe to that view. And I assume uh, one day we will understand that there are genetic and hormonal mechanisms that operate uh, through human sexual drive that results in same-sex attraction. But for the time being, we of course don't know what those uh, mechanisms are. And the way that I think about it is that in human society, we're all struggling to be a member of our group and be accepted and recognized and appreciated and loved. And so uh, for me, homosexuality is one of the challenges uh, of having recognition of full human rights in all groups that what, for whatever combination of reasons, there's a small number of people, maybe it's 5%, I don't know, who are almost exclusively or exclusively attracted to the same gender. And then there's another larger number of people, let's say it's 10%, I don't know, or 15% or 20%, who are sexually fluid and are attracted to both genders, males and females, not necessarily at the same time, perhaps at different points in the life cycle. Um, and when you look at their accumulative sexual behavior, you recognize that uh, they're attempting to also express their sexual orientation with different objects, depending upon the circumstances they're in. Mm -hmm. But do you think that it would work the same for homosexual men and women? Or are there any particularities that you noticed in your work, your studies, that would point to it being different between gays and lesbians? Yeah, I think we recognize now in the research literature that there are some differences. Some of them may be very important, which have to do with male and female uh, human development. Uh, Female development is associated with uh, certain internal forces, uh, which includes, of course, uh, menarche and uh, having uh, regular menstrual periods and uh, coming into sexual maturity that, of course, men don't have. And uh, men are also identified with certain kinds of social markers, uh, which includes having their first nocturnal mission um, and recognition of change in their bodies um, and when you put those together including the huge societal differences that surround gender roles gender roles and the way in which gender roles serve as the kind of stage or the kind of setting in which we reach um, mater maturity in adolescence it's easy to understand why boys and girls would have some differences in terms of their desires, their expressions of their feelings, uh, their ability to verbalize or articulate what they want, their feeling of having to conform to the gender role, uh, their feeling of being pressured into being heterosexually married, which many women still do, which accounts for the fact that even today, I, I guess it's probably still true that there's a larger number of lesbians who have a heterosexual marital history than there are men who had a heterosexual marital history because the gender role pressure uh, in patriarchal societies is so profound for women to be married and produce children at a relatively early age. And men have that pressure as well. But men are able to move, maneuver around the rules and engage in backstage or nefarious kinds of sex, including clandestine sex. Uh, and that's pretty common in many societies. So I think, yes, there are differences between males and females, and they're going to be manifested in, in 
patterns of sexual orientation, which I do think is probably more structured in men than it is in women. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also done work on ment uh, the mental health of homosexuals and the uh, factors that might impact it, particularly social and political factors. So earlier we talked about norms regarding sexuality. Would you say that norms surrounding homosexuality might impact the mental health of homosexuals? Oh, my goodness, yes, of course. That, that's tremendously important. Um, when a society um, creates um, a set of moral rules and expectations about what is natural and normal, and when people defy or challenge or break those rules, they're going to be judged. And in some places, they're going to be condemned and even punished, sometimes even severely punished or even killed. Um, and of course, that's what we see in the human rights violations of societies that are intolerant to same-sex gender expression. And it's, it's one of the great, and for me, truly sad realizations of human society that there are so many people that are willing to judge uh, and condemn and even punish people because of their sexual expressions. My, my general attitude in human development is that uh, sexual behavior, as long as it does not result in someone being harmed, is okay. And we should regard ex exceptions or variations, as long as there's no harm done, as part of, you know, the human capacity for play and for exploration. And, and children, if you watch children in many settings, children are just innately curious. They want to know. They want to explore and understand. And if left to their own devices, they will discover um, and experiment with each other about their their bodies and their sexuality. And my view is that when a society supports childhood sexual play and exploration that's done within the context of something that is playful and not harmful, when a society supports that, then you have recognition of a society that is more tolerant is more able to support human variation and human diversity. And when you see a society that immediately condemns children's sexual play or exploration, then you're dealing with a society that has the potential for punishment, for danger, even execution of the exceptions. And so um, it's very important for us to recognize that when societies allow a greater latitude of acceptance, of social approval, of sexual variations, that people in that society generally are mentally healthier. They do better, they have better lives, and they're happier. Is marriage denial specifically a problem? And if so, why? Is it because of uh, what it represents as a ritual? Well, in, in human society, marriage is one of the great markers of being human, of being human, of being fully accepted, fully adult, having the full social status of being a human person. And when people are denied that status, they're always being treated as a uh, subspecies as less than human, as less than fully adults. And I like to remember that Foucault, um, Michel Foucault, who was no great lover of human marriage, in fact, he dis detested marriage. He thought it was a bourgeois trap um, and also uh, a barrier to uh, female rights and feminism. Foucault famously said about 1960, uh, human society will never be attain uh, its full status until homosexuals can marry. 
Uh, and I puzzled over that for a long time. Why did Foucault give such precedence to human marriage? And I think it's because we recognize that in marriage, the society is bestowing the sense of equality on two adults who have chosen for reasons usually of love and happiness and family formation uh, each other and want to cherish that and want to make it part of what their community recognizes as being good and true and pure and right and normal and natural. And those are the words that we use when we recognize and approve of, of, of such an institution. So it's almost inevitable when a society decides to deny the right of marriage, they're creating two different social classes of citizens the haves and the have-nots, the people who are not able to attain full human recognition. And in my view, it's better to allow everyone to have full human recognition. Mm -hmm. So still talking about mental health, what aspects of gay and lesbian aging are worth considering? Well, this subject is changing very rapidly. Uh, in the last few years as a result of greater social status and social power of older LGBT people. Once upon a time, they were entirely invisibilized. It wasn't possible to, for an older person to express their sexual orientation or desires. Everybody assumed that they were, were heterosexual. And uh, in general, they weren't going to rock the boat because they didn't want to to be excluded uh, from what was considered normal and natural. And I have, my mother is almost 92, and I was recently in the nursing home where she lives, and uh, I was sitting at lunch with she and her, uh, her friends, um, and my mother is still compass mentor. She still has her personality, and she still knows who she is, and she still is, likes to meet people and so on. And she was talking about an older man who had recently been admitted into independent living where she is. And she was saying she thought it was strange that he didn't have uh, a partner. Uh, and he was sitting by himself. And as I was sitting there, I said to her, Mom, don't you realize, you know, he may be a gay man. And she was, uh, she, my mother's perfectly okay with, with people being gay or homosexual. She said, oh, my goodness, I never even thought about it. Could somebody be inside this, you know, the nursing home who's gay? And I said, of course they could. You know, they're, they're everywhere. Why wouldn't they be here? So it, it's just one very simple example from last week in which we see that it's very easy to invisibilize people by their orientation. And that process of invisibilizing, of course, is harmful because then people aren't recognized for who they really are, and sometimes for having a partner and having a life or having children or having adopted children and, and so on and so on. Um, and there's many other things that we could say about this, including the fact that the, the society has gradually allowed older gays and lesbians to be recognized, um, to have hospital visitation rights, to have caretaker rights, to inherit each other's property, uh, to form their own families, uh, to be recognized in settings like nursing homes and so on, which in my opinion is really very positive for older older people in our society. Mm -hmm. So a specific question uh, a ver about a very specific topic. Would you say that the way society dealt with homosexuals a few decades ago if, uh, had an impact on how they were affected by AIDS? Yeah, um, without doubt. The, uh, discrimination against uh, gay and lesbian people and homophobia, which means the hatred of uh, gay people, without doubt, uh, they were tremendous barriers in treating HIV and AIDS as a public health problem rather than as a problem of personal morality. But sadly, when a HIV and AIDS 
uh, came to public recognition around 1981, we had a president of the United States, President Reagan, uh, who was never going to say the word gay in public and never going to recognize uh, the issue of the association between homosexuality and HIV. And that, in general, thwarted treating this as a public health problem. Um, and it was not until his Surgeon General, who was a Mormon, uh, one day said, look, let's stop treating this as a problem of personal morality. Let's treat it as a problem of public health. It was only then that things began to change. And that's despite the fact that President Reagan had lots of personal friends in Hollywood who were gay, such as the actor Rock Hudson. They, it was just a fact. But in that generation, they separated the public and the private so severely that because of their shame of homosexuality, the shame ascribed to it and the shame that they felt about it and embarrassment. And once that was rectified and the federal government began to authorize research and treatment, then things began to change immediately. But a lot of damage had been done and a lot of gay men were killed or were uh, died as a result of neglect and abandonment and exclusion by their families and lack of treatment and doctors making bad recommendations and doctors not knowing what HIV was or the symptoms of it, uh, like pneumonia and, and so on and so on. And unfortunately, there's, that has left a kind of gap or hole in the generation of people like myself, because we knew so many people who died of HIV and who were never replaced, of course. And it's interesting when the pandemic, uh, the great COVID pandemic of 2019 came along and people began to respond to this horrible set of conditions that we've all lived through for the, for the uh, last two years. There's been recognition in the gay community on the part of some of the survivors of that HIV and AIDS epidemic that this was the second time that they went through a pandemic, not the first. And in the second time, they realized that they had the resources and wherewithal to cope with what was happening in a different way than society was because they'd already been through it and they'd already suffered some of the trauma. And so I think that our society has now recognized that the way that we dealt with the HIV AIDS epidemic at the beginning was not correct, that it was negligent, that it caused undue harm to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Hurt, just before we go, would you like to tell us again about the new book you're working on and would you already have a publication date for it? No, that's premature. But okay. my new book, which is going to be called um, The Singers Are Gone, is really the story of how Chimbari's sexual culture changed over a period of almost 50 years. Uh, and it went from this very, very focused ritual sex to a much expanded definition of what constitutes human sexuality is, and is closer to what we have today. And I'm hoping if all goes well and God is willing, by the end of 2023, it'll be out in print. And so I'll be sure to get you a copy so you you can know about it. Well, thank you so much. I'm very much looking forward to seeing it out and reading it. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. You're, you're most welcome. Have a nice day. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. 
I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Nieberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Ugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, and Max Belby. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanek, Dam Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nun Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.